Hi, all. Welcome to the first strategy and operations panel featuring uh, fellow leaders from DoorDash. This is will be the first of many strategy and operations focused speaker events. Um, and by the way, you may hear us refer to strategy and operations as SNO during the call, and that's just an internal acronym. Um, we've got a panel here of really great leaders across DoorDash that are eager to share their experiences and journeys with you. As a reminder, we'll be recording the event and please drop questions in the Q&A box during during the during the event and we have we have fellow team members that are excited to answer the questions that you have. If we can't get to one of your questions that you that you add into the Q and a we'll follow up after um, via email. Great so let's jump in uh, let me first introduce myself, my name is Lauren Zanitas and I leave lead our fulfillment ops team on doordash drive which is DoorDash's white label fulfillment platform. My team cares deeply about ensuring every delivery is done to a high degree of fidelity as well as profitably. We're also leading the charge into exploring new fulfillment types and new fulfillment capabilities. Rob, let's go to you next. Awesome, thanks Lauren. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Rob. I'm based in San Francisco uh, and I lead our Drive International team. So um, as Lauren mentioned, Drive is our white label platform business aimed at empowering merchants, um, merchants owned native channels. And within Drive, one of our core products is white label delivery fulfillment, wherein we leverage DoorDash drivers to fulfill orders placed directly from a merchant's own website or app. Uh, as a specific example, uh, if, if you download the Chipotle app and order delivery, those orders are all fulfilled by DoorDash drivers. Um, and today I'm responsible for growing drive in our existing markets, as well as launching into new markets. Toby, you're up next. Hey everyone, I'm Toby Espinosa. I lead the ads business here at DoorDash. Uh, I'm based in New York. Um, I uh, The ads business, for reference, for those of you that don't know, is a new business here built over the last couple of years. We basically help uh, anyone, any brand on DoorDash, whether you're in a, uh, a Dash Mart or a 7-Eleven, a, a Walgreens, um, or a local restaurant grow on our platform using our products. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, one of those products later, sponsored listings for restaurants. It's great to see everybody, and I also am going to add my uh, the my favorite order on DoorDash just for fun, uh, which is uh, which is electric burrito here in Manhattan. Uh, for those of you who hadn't tried it, I'm going to give some free marketing for one of our customers, uh, electric burrito. And let's go to Imani next. Hi everyone. I apologize, my video and, and Zoom is not working today, but the picture gives a nice representation of what I look like when I'm not speaking. I am the general manager of the Southeast region. I've been at DoorDash since 2019. Um, and so my role here is to accelerate growth within the Southeast region. So that includes Georgia, Mississippi, Tennessee, North and South Carolinas, and, and uh, Alabama. And so Atlanta is a big market in the region, and my North Star is category growth. And so we accelerate, try to accelerate growth by looking at what the central team is doing and accelerating that, as well as identifying unique opportunities in the Southeast that, that can accelerate growth. Uh, you set the bar high with uh, top favorite um, order, I feel like I need to follow suit. I would say there's a, there's a restaurant called Comfort M2 uh, in Atlanta that I really love because I'm a vegetarian and they have like a cauliflower po' boy that I enjoy. I'm originally from New York, uh, but I live in Atlanta now. And then I'll hand it over to Cody. Thank you, Imani. Now I gotta like think about what I like to order on DoorDash. Um, <clears throat> So I lead the, the global Dasher logistics uh, and quality function here at, at DoorDash. The, the simplest way to think about it is just fulfillment. Um, basically, you all probably had something delivered. Um, that is what I work on. <laughs> uh, it's quality of the experience for drivers. It's quality of the experience for customers. It's cost of fulfillment for DoorDash. And it's also the quality of the fulfillment experience for merchants as well. So really all three sides of the, the marketplace and, and just making sure that um, we are able to deliver on the promises that we that we set every day, um, multiple, multiple times a day. My favorite order on DoorDash. Oh, man, uh, I sit in Austin, Texas. So I guess that's a that's a thing I should share. I'm originally from Las Vegas. Um, <clears throat> my favorite order on DoorDash, I'll do two. There's my most frequently ordered. I feel like everybody else shared their cool order. So I'll start with my cool order, which is Mooney's Burgers in Austin. If you live in Austin or you haven't been in Austin, like Mooney's Burgers, it's the spot. Um, uh, it's one of my favorites. But then I'll also give you my real answer, which is like, what is the thing I order the most? 
Uh, and that is Chipotle. So I am a human just like all of us and I order Chipotle a lot. It's just a very efficient, uh, consistent operation. So big fan of Chipotle. Uh, that's a little about me. Awesome. Thank you all for those intros. So I want to jump right in, Cody, and I'd love to start with you. How would you define SNO at DoorDash and how do you think about what skills and competencies are needed to succeed in, in an SNO role? All right. <clears throat> Sorry, I got lost the mute button here. Um, so I'd say that strategy and ops teams are the quote unquote glue at DoorDash. Our responsibility is to leverage all of the expertise that exists within DoorDash to ultimately deliver value to our end customers. So you'll, you'll hear everybody talk about customers a lot. Um, when we say customer, that can mean Dasher, the primary customer I serve is the Dasher, but there's also the merchant, the consumer. Um, those are all customers that we serve. And so um, what you'll hear is that this requires you to understand what that customer needs. Um, and it, it requires you to get very crisp on the problem that you're solving for that customer. Be curious, use data to make decisions. Um, it also requires extreme ownership. You have to, half the job is finding the right problem. The, the other half, you can't just find the problem and then say, oh, there's another team and like you all should fix this thing. And that would be great for our customers. Um, you have to own that, right? You have to drive the change to make sure that that customer's problem is solved completely. That's what I think about uh, in terms of s and um, But that, that's, my, that's my perspective. I'm excited to hear from the rest of the panelists as well. Yeah, thank you, Cody, on that. I think extreme ownership really hits the nail on the head of that. You really have to think about this like cyclicality of problem identification, root causing, um, and execution. And without that, um, it, it, it really falls apart quickly. Rob, I'd love to hear, do you see the sim do you see a similar kind of cyclicality extreme ownership play out on, in our international space? Yeah, absolutely. I would say um, when it comes to international, it's all about testing quickly, being lean and scrappy. And so like getting back to the question of strategy and operations, right? Um, on the strategy side, it's what are we doing and why are we doing something, which is extra critical in international because you just have so many options um, on launch, right? There are just so many different places we could launch. Um, so first it's really getting crisp on what we're doing, why we're doing it. And on the operation side, it's really about how do we get it done, right? Like, how do we get it, how do we make it actually happen? Um, so plainly speaking, that's just laying out step-by-step step every single thing that needs to happen and being really closely coordinated with every team that needs to be involved, whether it be finance, marketing, product, engineering, support, legal, uh, oftentimes international tax, right? And so once you have that plan, um, it's all about execution. So. Um, I will say that in many places, uh, you know, the functions are separate, but at DoorDash, because of our bias for extreme ownership um, and our belief that, you know, understanding the lowest level of detail and it will enable you to be the most successful. Um, here, we, we really empower our folks to not only write the strategy, but then go do it themselves. Love that. Toby, do you, how do you see that playing out uh, in, in ads? Yeah, I, I, I agree with obviously the, the first two uh, folks, uh, as I work with them a, a lot. The only thing I would add is um, <clears throat> this sort of idea of extreme ownership comes from a sense of um, of empathy. I think a lot of us have direct kind of con uh, uh, direct a direct level of we need to drive an outcome. A lot of times, I say um, our our team are not reporters. We're the people that make the news. We're the ones moving moving numbers. Um, but at the same time, we may or may not own the functions that move those numbers directly. Rob mentioned finance, analytics, product, engineering. All of those people don't directly report into us, but we have to figure out a way through empathy and kind of cross what we call cross-functional collaboration to bring everybody onto the same page and to move our business forward. Um, and so it is both, yes, this kind of extreme ownership, but extreme ownership from a, from a, place, from a place of empathy and understanding every part problem and the root cause of every problem to move things forward. I love that touch on empathy. And I think it goes back, Cody, to what you were saying about it's just consumer obsession. Um, and that's led from this, again, deep sense of empathy that I think we all feel all feel uh, on the SNO team. Amani, would love to hear um, from you from the GM perspective, how you think about SNO at DoorDash. I would agree with what my colleague said. I think the other piece is being very action oriented, uh, being very inquisitive. And I think that goes to being customer obsessed, right? And so, you know, in my market, I pay attention to the numbers every day. So if I see a metric that looks off, then I will, you know, make sure that we double click to the lowest level of detail. And I think that, 
you have to be inquisitive to drive you to even want to understand what's at that lowest level of detail, because sometimes what you need to change is very simple, right? So I think that's what, what's most critical there. Great, um, cool. Let's so let's um now that we've got a baseline for what SNO what good looks like uh, from an SNO perspective at DoorDash, I want to start Rob with you to understand how did your previous life and career get you to DoorDash? Um, what skills did you take from your other pieces of life, and and what do you really rely on here? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my my first job out of graduate school was uh, was at an analyst at a consulting firm. Um, this role really helped to uh, develop my comfort and discipline with data. Um, and also gave me some, some insights into how large companies operated. Um, at the same time, I was also involved in a, a variety of different sort of side projects and little startups. Uh, an interesting one was uh, a buddy of mine uh, started a tequila company that I was a part of. Uh, we essentially just hustled and sold tequila door to door for a little bit. Um, and so that really sort of helped develop my entrepreneurial spirit and my sort of like uh, understanding of how to get things done. Um, and I really joined DoorDash because I wanted to solve hard problems with uh, tangible impact. Um, and actually, when I first joined DoorDash on the Drive team, my role was simply to uh, figure out how to grow Drive. Um, and I would say, in many ways, that's still my still my job today. Love that, um, Toby. Would love to hear from you next. Yeah, um, I uh, kind of the core skill set. So I've been at DoorDash for around seven years. Um, and before leading the ads business as I do today, kind of on the strategy and operation side, I was one of those, um, what you call like functional experts. So I uh, built out our business development and partnerships team. And so I would say the kind of like the core superpower that I lean on um, uh, most during my, uh, during my time here is the thing I've developed, developed at DoorDash for uh, four years, which was kind of learning from our largest customers and um, learning from them. You've heard it from a bunch of us before, um, but tactically what that means is understanding, um, understanding their needs when you're going out and building their product. Um, I, I think in uh, generally in business, a lot of folks say they're customer first. This, the, the idea of being customer first is like, we hear it all the time, hear it all the time. But I think tactically what that means um, is speaking to them constantly. Today, I had three uh, customer conversations, um, really being uh, embedding yourself within that sort of ethos, which is kind of a core pillar of, of how I've been able to be successful here at DoorDash. Great. Um, Amani, would love to hear from you. Uh, so prior to DoorDash, I was in consulting, management consulting, uh, and, and in entrepreneurship, and then client services uh, within the advertising space. And so I think all of those backgrounds kind of come together in what makes me successful here. So when I joined DoorDash in 2019 in a special ops role, and so that enabled me to essentially special ops for, for those who are probably unaware uh, is an internal consulting role. So we're either helping teams uh, internally, we we're working on special projects to, for any one of our customers. Uh, and one of the things that I worked on here was uh, business planning. So essentially looking at business strategy from the highest level down to operations at the lowest level. And I think that my, I guess, diverse background uh, probably helped prepare the most for that. Uh, and then this is going to be contradictory, I would say almost nothing prepares you for your role at DoorDash. And so the, the reason I came here was I wanted PL experience. So for people who are on the webinar and are in client services, sometimes it's hard to make that leap. And this is one of the reasons I wanted to, to come to DoorDash. And so I think, uh, you know, strategically, my experience has prepared me to do the work, right? I'm analytical, I'm fast paced, I'm extremely inquisitive, uh, but the day to day uh, is something that only you can experience here and the day the day prior prepares you for the day uh, coming up. Great, Cody. Do you want to round us out? Yeah, I'll dig. I'll dig deeper into the to the background because I'm not going to be there. I think my I developed a like I have a really strong competitive spirit and like I like to win. Um, that is just like who I am. Uh, I played sports growing up. I played football in college, uh, small college, nothing cool. You never watched me on TV. Um, I learned a lot about teamwork, ownership, accountability, um, how you're all in this together, one team, one fight. Um, I had a lot of different jobs before DoorDash. Uh, I lived in Las Vegas, I'm from Las Vegas, and so I worked in casinos. I did everything from running slot floors 
If you've ever been to the New York, New York or the Mandalay Bay in Las Vegas, I redesigned those slot floors some years ago. And so that's my, my fun claim to fame. Uh, I worked on IT systems, analyzing table game performance. I think I learned a lot about hospitality and how it's not about just like going above and beyond for customers once, but you have to do it every minute of every day. Um, at DoorDash, I think I've used both of those things uh, a lot. So I have a, I, I've leveraged these. I have an intense focus on solving problems, which I, I like think about as like winning for our customers. Um, I, I've had to work across a lot of teams while ultimately taking ownership for the result, right? This one team, one, one fight mentality that we have. Um, the fun part about my role and what we do is that we're only as good as our last delivery. Um, we don't we, like the need for operational excellence is is very real in our business. Um, I've been lucky to have opportunities that uh, have helped me prepare for that, but that's uh, a little bit about my journey. That's great. Yeah, I, I think I hopefully what um what everyone is taking away is that at DoorDash we really we really intake a lot of different and diverse skill sets. You don't need to have a background in logistics. You don't need to have kind of this typical. Um, consulting or, or, or investment banking background, we're really trying to understand what are ways in which we can look at problems from a from a bunch of different lenses. Again, kind of back to Toby, I, I love this framing that you had earlier around like developing this deep level of empathy for, for our consumer. Um, and then again, our customers being this three-sided marketplace, the dasher, the merchant, um, and, and, our, and our end customer. Um, cool, so the team prepared some pretty cool, um, pro, uh, some pretty cool uh, projects that they've worked on in the past, um, and so we'd love to jump into those into those first. So, Toby, uh, I'd love for you to share uh, that what you've worked on. Awesome. So, um, as I said before, I lead I lead the ads business at DoorDash. So, we kind of have two major customer cohorts. We have our restaurants. So, uh, think your Shake Shacks, your Wing Stops, but also your your local restaurants, Electric Burrito here in Manhattan, Suvla in San Francisco, uh, um, uh, you know, Pluckers in Austin, Texas. So we have like a, a, a broad a range of restaurants. And then we also have our CPG partners. Today, I'm gonna to talk about our restaurant partners. Um, and so around two years ago, when we founded this, this business, we had a ton of our large, uh, a ton of our restaurant partners, which I would call, um, you know, your, your kind of pre, your prime local restaurants were asking us, I, I would love incremental ways to grow on your platform. So we spent a lot of time looking through trying to build this business. And at a very fundamental level, what it is, is a, 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 a kind of a, a tile card, a store tile card moved up in the flow within search and cuisine categories. And so the cuisine category would be at the top if you all have used DoorDash before, the chicken, the dessert categories, and also search when you're typing and searching. And basically all that we're doing is moving a restaurant that would have been in the organic feed up in front of you, the consumer, to remind you that that restaurant exists for you to order from. Um, and so that's kind of at a basic level, that's the consumer view of this product. But under the hood, I just wanted to talk a little bit about under the hood. Um, we, for 12, and, uh, 12 months, 18 months, basically built out our infrastructure at DoorDash um, to, to be able to handle this type of thing. We built a second price auction uh, so that so that when two restaurants in the same geography want the same space and are bidding different amounts, who wins that auction in order for them uh, in order for them to be placed in that card? As you can imagine, there is actually quite uh, quite deep density of decision making between restaurants in a given geography in a city like New York, San Francisco, or um, even in a lot of our suburban markets in Phoenix and other places like that and in Florida. There's a lot of uh, density of people trying to uh, get into that space. So one was the actual innovation on the auction system itself, building it in-house. But more importantly, we actually built a system based off of a CPA, which is cost per action or cost per acquisition, depending on, depending on the part of the, the marketing industry that you're in, which basically means we will not charge our restaurants for placing their brand in front of a consumer unless that consumer actually transacts. Um, and that was kind of like the core innovation that we made in the advertising space. Most advertising partners, like most of our competitors, charge on a CPC basis, which means I would just have to click on this ad, not actually convert. Um, and so what this does is it might seem like a small innovation on the margin, but a small innovation on the margin, listening to your customer actually has a, has, has a pretty dramatic effect on where you end up um, from a competitive standpoint. And so... Um, 
and most importantly, if you think about who this helps, yes, it helps our restaurants because our restaurants are not charged for what we would call wasted impressions. A lot of the impressions have to be good for the consumer, but it also helps our consumers because um, our ad business is gold off of making sure now that the right content is in front of the right consumer at the right time. Otherwise, we won't hit our own internal goals. And so I think this is both kind of the, the product itself and talking a little bit about the ads business, but also very importantly, I think a lot of us focus on incentives and making sure that incentives are aligned across different pieces of our marketplace. And when we find incentives uh, kind of aligned across our marketplace, that's what we call our flywheel, which I think Imani is going to talk more about, but kind of the flywheel of driving business forward without having to manually, uh, without having to manually find that. So that is a perfect kind of product market fit. That's me. Thanks, Toby. Uh, Cody, would love to hear from you on the Gas Rewards program. Yeah, <clears throat> topical. Um, lots of fun projects that I've worked on. I figured I'd pick the most recent one. Um, I think as everyone knows, there's been a recent increase in gas prices, not only across the United States, but across the world. Um, and so as a dasher, what does that mean? Well, my number one expense as a dasher is how much I spend on gas. And so I'm making less money after my expenses every day. Why does this matter to us as a business? Um, aside from delivering value to our customers and, and um, making sure that we're delivering on what they need, this needs to be sustainable for dashers. Um, and if it's not, then they'll stop dashing and then they'll choose another option. And we'll also um, need to figure out a path to deliver everything and, and make sure that we do have a plan to cover that. So. How did we get to this solution? So some of you might have seen that we rolled out a gas rewards program, which is a few different tiers. Um, I will, I'm will. i not going to talk specifically about the gas rewards program. You'll see it on the left. It's There's some bonus programs, and then there's some cash back with some, some debit card that is proprietary to DoorDash. Um, and then, great, how do, we, how do we get to the solution? So I think that everything starts with the customer. Um, this is what Toby has highlighted with empathy. This is what the whole panel has highlighted. So the first thing is the dasher in this case. How do you, what are, how are they feeling? What's going on? Like you have to talk to them in a human way. Um, I get probably 30 or 40 emails directly from dashers every day with just, hey, here's some feedback about this. Here's some feedback. Like, what you don't realize once you join SNO, you do become a support agent uh, of, of some sort. And Amani's laughing because she knows she's probably got 16 people from Atlanta that like have her personal cell phone that are like, why did my restaurant not available? And so you start by talking to those customers and having that genuine relationship with them. So we talked to 30 plus individuals. We talked to members of the Dasher Community Council. There's countless emails, support conversations you can go through to start to get an understanding of, okay, how are people feeling? And the answer was, yeah, they, there, is, there is a need right now to come to this. And that, that seems obvious, right? But how you come to that need matters a lot. And so that's what we, that's what we kind of thought about. And so we, you got to get to the lowest level of detail. And that's what these conversations help. Um, so you understand not only how dashers are feeling about the situation, but also how are they thinking about these expenses in the context of their everyday life? What is it that they, that they think about? They think about it per fill up or per gallon. Do they think about it per delivery? Do they think about it per mile? Do they think about, how are they thinking about it, right? And what we heard was, oh, I'm gonna spend 20 bucks in gas today. I'm gonna spend 20, 20 bucks extra in gas today. Oh, I'm gonna spend 40 bucks extra in gas today. And you'd hear them say, Oh, well, my, my cost per gallon is, you know, it's, I used to spend three, now I spend four, like this is crazy. And you, you can start to understand, okay, how are they thinking about these things? And then how can I make sure that what I deliver is ultimately giving them that, right? Um, and the last thing is you have to solve the problem. Um, a lot of people think that like, oh, well, we should do this because it's like good and we can talk about it and we can say things to drivers and that's a good thing. And that's not why you do this. That's not why any of us are here. Um, we're here to solve problems for real people um, and we're here to help them reach their goals. And so for us, it, it meant we had to focus on the acute increase in expenses. We had to do it in a meaningful way. And we had to create a program that scaled with the amount of gas that you were using. Um, and so it can't be one size fits all. It needs to be accessible. Um, and that's ultimately how we got where we got. But that's this is just an example of um, how you go from this really complex topic that seems very, uh, I think somebody 
in SNO, his name's Casey North. Everyone on this call will know him. But he has a saying where the, only, the way you eat an elephant is one bite at a time. And this is an elephant, right? It feels like an insurmountable problem. What am I going to do? How do I do this? Oh, my goodness. Um, and the reality is if you start with the customer and you get to the lowest level of detail and you actually solve the problem, nine times out of 10, you're right. And you'll look back and you'll have eaten the elephant. And so this is just a good example of that in practice. But I think I can kick it over to Amani, and I hope I got that right. Um, but I think Amani's next. So hopefully she doesn't have a bunch of examples about uh, customer support. <laughs> Uh, no, thanks, Toby. Uh, we've all had our fair share of customer support, dasher support, and merchant. So there is definitely a food truck who calls me at least once every two weeks. Uh, so uh, for me, as a general manager of the Southeast region, I think of myself as a CEO of my region. So I consistently think about our flywheel. So the flywheel, as we talked about, includes consumers, merchants, and dashers. And so, you know, we're, because we are a three-sided marketplace. So how I think about my, my region is my North Star is category share growth and my constraint is profitability, right? So I don't necessarily have a profitability target, but I want to make sure that we remain profitable. And so I'll talk through three, three, two examples today on kind of what some of my day-to-day -day looks like. And so on the left-hand side, one of the challenges we have is, you know, growing market. That's how you grow uh, category share. And so there are a couple of ways you grow share, grow volume, let's say, grow consumers at a faster rate than we're churning consumers, and then you grow frequency of orders. And then the third one, I would say, is increasing um, consumer re uh, retention, right? But that kind of falls in that first example I gave. So the problem here is we needed to drive incremental awareness among new customers and churn customers in the Atlanta metro area. And so there are obviously the standard uh, ways that you would do some marketing and some outreach. And obviously, because we're we are in the region, then we are accelerating things that the, the central team is doing, as well as kind of finding our own initiative. So we wanted to find something that was unique to the Southeast that we think we thought would have some sticky customer acquisition. So we partnered with uh, HBCU Battle of the Bands. So if you aren't familiar, it is a showcase and actually a fundraiser for uh, historically black colleges and universities and uh, of the uh, showcase of the bands. And so they held this in Atlanta, once a, one, they hold it once a year, they have one in uh, Charlotte as well. And so one was coming up last quarter and we decided to, to partner with it. We thought it was a unique use case. There were um, you know, more than 15,000 people attending. So it's a mega event. Uh, and so we, but we wanted to find a unique way to engage with this this event, right? We didn't want to just be, you know, the official sponsor of this event, right? That doesn't help me track new customers. That doesn't help me offer their our value prop to our customers or to our consumers. And so, what we did, um, what you see here, is an example of how we kind of really integrated ourselves with the event, right? So we ended up having um, an HBCU culture hashtag and kind of DoorDash on the bass drums of, of one of the bands, we ended up engaging pre-event so that we can actually speak to every uh, attendee who came through the door, see if they had DoorDash, allowed them to uh, sign up live with DoorDash. We gave out uh, one of those uh, sanitizers, which is, you know, high, high commodity in this environment. Um, and we ended up getting uh, new customers at a, at a price tag that was definitely less less expensive than doing some of the local media. Additionally, we were able to expand our college footprint. So as you might have seen in the news on Monday, we just launched our uh, student dash pass. And so prior to launching that, overall, most of the regions were working on acquiring as many new college students as we can. So it really unlocked a large group of students that we may not have approached in our first round of college outreach, mostly because a lot of the schools here are smaller, right? Sub less than 10,000 students, if you will. And so this allowed us to really be customer obsessed. The one insight that came about for us was that high school students are using DoorDash, which I never really thought about. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I got my first phone, you know, maybe like last year of high school or something like that. So the fact that people are using uh, their phones in high school to order DoorDash was a great insight for us, right? So that helps drive the strategy, you know, next quarter. Maybe we need to tap into that market. Uh, and so that's one example of how we really focus and tried to find something sticky within a market that drove um, volume and new customers. 
Another example that I'll call out, uh, which isn't always as sexy, if you will, um, is uh, how we look at our operations to drive volume and to, um, to root cause an issue. So one example, uh, one problem we had was that profit was down in one geography, not in the region, but a smaller sub, a sub market. And we looked and driver costs did not increase, revenue had increased. So, you know, where was the source of this issue? Our hypothesis was that it was credits and refunds that were driving this negative trend. So after doing some analysis, we found out that the root cause was that there was one restaurant who had a high rate of missing and incorrect orders. I'm sure everyone has had a time when you've ordered, uh, you know, a meal from let's say Chipotle, maybe not Chipotle Cody, Cody because they're efficient. Um, and you know, one thing was missing. And so usually customers get credits. And obviously that hits my bottom line. So we evaluated this restaurant and we see that there are some of the, the top 10 items you see on the left side of this uh, image of the image of the items that were actually missing. And then we double clicked and we looked at the menu, right? The menu says, if you can see, chicken fettuccine alfredo, and then it asks you to add chicken. So the biggest error that we saw here was that people were getting chicken alfredo, what they thought was gonna be chicken alfredo with no chicken, because you actually had to check the box that said chicken, right? So the simple fix here was to just not call it chicken alfredo so that people can select their protein. Once we did that, the, um, the missing and incorrects for this store dropped 50%. Right. And then from there, we decided to actually evaluate all of the menus uh, from kind of high and missing and incorrect um, mer uh, merchants. And so from there, we saw our profits started to uh, flatten and then actually uh, rise again. So these are just two examples of kind of how I prioritize my time to really drive category share growth and drive volume growth uh, in the market. And then from there, I think I'm handing it over to Rob. Yes. Awesome. Um, so would love to share uh, one of my favorite projects that I've ever worked on at DoorDash, which is uh, building DoorDash storefront. So um, it's a totally different side of our business. Um, and it's also one of our, I would say, fastest growing and most exciting uh, pieces of the business. Um, so just to sort of backtrack again, right? So um, the delivery fulfillment proposition on Drive is if you are a merchant and you offer delivery, but you don't have the resources, time, effort, energy to hire or manage your own fleet, right? DoorDash is a solution for you. Um, you we can take the operational burden off your hands uh, and enable you to essentially leverage our fleet to fulfill orders on your behalf, um, while you, the merchant, then uh, get back and focus on making awesome food. Um, and so as we scaled the delivery fulfillment side of the business, right, we noticed that uh, many merchants were struggling to get online. Um, there are lots of options in the market. And as we begin to have more and more conversations and go deeper into uh, enabling merchants on delivery fulfillment, um, we really began to feel like there are many more opportunities uh, for us to better serve them by perhaps even rolling out our own online ordering solution, right? So um, how do we validate this feeling and this hypothesis is uh, we started by being just customer obsessed. Now, um, the problem we're really trying to solve for here is, you know, as a merchant, how can I really, really easily and quickly get started with building my own online business um, in a way that is, you know, the, the and, right, that is both cost effective and using best in class solutions. And um, what we really did was we just had as many conversations as we possibly could, right? So we had well over 50 discovery calls with our merchant partners. Uh, we got to the lowest level of detail, right? So with these conversations, um, we were able to really identify specific pain points and needs with uh, the merchant's existing solutions and some of the different challenges that they had with just getting online. Um, everything from uh, payments to technological implementation to support, um, you know, these are some of the different key, key uh, problem areas. And once we sort of were able to refine our hypothesis, um, we had to really dream big and start small. So uh, at DoorDash, there's lots and lots of roadmaps. Everybody is operating well over capacity. So how do you take the first step? Uh, we actually went to Hackathon. So that's a surprising fun fact that uh, our DoorDash storefront business really came out of our Hackathon. So um, the team was able to uh, bring together all of our learnings and build a case and then go sell this internally during Hackathon to build sort of a version 0.1 uh, to go prove concept, right? So 
now, today, um, if you're a merchant who wants to start their own online ordering channel, but you don't have the technical capabilities or the resources to build your own website or hire someone to do it for you, um, DoorDash has a solution for you as well, right? So um, we're super excited about Storefront because it unlocks an entirely new surface area for us to build upon. And uh, I would say uh, Storefront is one of our next billion dollar businesses uh, and is a key bet uh, for the future of our drive platform. Thanks all. Um, it, what I loved in each and everyone's stories is really about um, back to back to our dearest Casey North, uh, VP of Drive, taking that bite, um, starting and starting small, um, and not kind of getting getting uh, lost with the enormity of the vision that we're trying to achieve. Um, cool. Okay, we're going to move to a lightning round. So, Toby, I want to start with you. What do you think is the most challenging aspect of working at DoorDash? Um. I think I think my version of the Casey North quote is um, in order to climb <clears throat> in order to come in order to climb a mountain, you have to take the first hill. And I think it, it's hard for folks to kind of see both. We have a we have a very, very large vision at DoorDash. You can I mean, you could see it across here. You have storefront white label business. You have a marketplace management business in a region. You have Dasher and logistics across uh, multiple geographies. You have ads. Um, there's so many areas and surface areas that we're continuing to grow because we have each of these customers and the deeper we go with each customer, the more needs we see that they need, uh, for us to potentially fulfill. And so I actually think the hardest part for us is prioritization, um, prioritization, and then action on that, on that prioritization, um, which I think is the hardest part. And then the second part is, is, is continuing to hire great people. Um, a company is. Uh, is only as good as the collection of people that it has within it. Um, and so I think those are the two things. I took two, apologies. No, that's okay, we'll allow it. Uh, Amani, what's your most challenging? I think extreme ownership uh, because you are a directly responsible person for when something goes right, which is awesome. And then also when something goes wrong, which is not as awesome, but ideally you're looking at it as a learning opportunity. And I think, am I supposed to do most rewarding as well or just, We'll, we'll, we'll go to that one next. I want to start with, with challenging Cody, tell us the most um, challenging. Oh man. Um, I think the most challenging, the most challenging thing about, I think that the, there are so many problems to solve and there are so many things that you can do. Um, and so you really have to get good about finding what, is going to move the needle and executing on that. And that's a really hard skill in itself. And for me personally, like, I just want to fix everything. It's like what I, it's like who I am. It's like what I want to do. And so it's like been really hard for me to grow as a person. Like that's been the most challenging thing is grow as a person with, I can't fix everything. So let's pick the things and fix those things. And then we'll get to everything. So that's what I would say is my answer. Maybe it's similar to Toby's, but that, that's my answer. How about you, Rob? I would say very in line with the rest of the answers. Um, the most challenging piece is really just how do we continue to innovate um, and look for new ways to uh, continue to grow, right? It's, it's very easy to get lost in the day-to-day the -day, um, and the objective right in front of you. But I would say like at DoorDash, we, we really push ourselves to continue to find ways to innovate and do new things, uh, you know, in the, in the sea of options, right? You have this, this like, uh, multiverse of possibility, right? How do we figure out where to go and, and how to go uh, in the right in the right way? Well, cool. Amani, since you were ready for most rewarding, start us off. Oh, I was ready because it's the same answer. So um, the, uh, you know, an extreme ownership definitely uh, is most rewarding because you know that this is the footprint this is the initiative that you ideated that you, you know, with your team and the cross-functional teams have put into to place and ha have the ability to execute as well as see the rewards uh, come through. I think, you know, sometimes we see for, from a general manager perspective from a region, I'll see it in, you know, new, new category uh, share, right? Whereas some of my colleagues, you'll see it, they have very public 
uh, rewards, right? So seeing uh, the gas initiative, seeing storefront. And so I think that's what makes it most rewarding is that because you are um, the extreme owner, then you get to, along with the, the team, kind of take uh, credit for that. And the other piece is that you feel uh, valued, right? So if, if you are a person who gets value from uh, knowing that people value your work, then, you know, you get that here. So that's very rewarding. And to know that you have full decision-making rights. And it's not just at, you know, director and up level. I mean, my, this, some of the most junior people on my team have extreme ownership, right? So I expect them to whatever their goal is to own it so that when it works well, it's great. And then also helps with you know, moving fast. If you know the one person you need to speak to to move forward versus, you know, having a whole panel of people that you need to, to make that decision. Awesome. Uh, Cody, most rewarding. Impact, 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 impact. Uh, we get to have a really big impact on people's lives in a meaningful way every day, uh, multiple times a day. And that is just a really rewarding experience. It's really cool to think about, um, this didn't exist six or seven years ago, and now it does. And that's really, really cool. So that's the biggest thing for me. Cool. How about you, Toby? I would say um, I, I, all the answers are great. I would say like the diversity of both the work from like an intellectual standpoint, so like the different customer cohorts, right? I mean, you, even again on this call, you have a multitude of different people addressing different customer problems. So I think like the the uh, diversity of, of problems to solve uh, is the most rewarding thing for me. Um, awesome. Rob, want to close us out? Yeah, absolutely. Um, same, I mean, innovation, impact, um, being able to solve hard problems and actually see the outcome. Um, but I would also uh, be remiss if I didn't bring up the people, right? And the friends and the relationships that you build along the way. That's also been really, really, really rewarding for me personally, just in terms of like um, being able to meet a lot of really awesome people and work with uh, people that are much smarter than myself uh, and really happy to be able to call them my friends today. That hits nicely on um, on what Toby said. Ultimately, you know, DoorDash is a collection of people um, and I think we all get to solve really hard problems alongside some pretty, pretty incredible folks, which is pretty cool. Okay, let's jump to our last question. So, you know, we're cognizant. Um, a lot, of, a lot of folks are here thinking about growing your own career in SNO, and so um, we want to we want to be able to impart some advice that we've seen in our career. So, Rob, start with you. What advice would you give to those looking to start their career in SNO? Um, yeah, and start. Let's start there. Yeah, uh, great question. Uh, for me, this this hits very very personally. Uh, the answer is just to start. Uh, which, which may seem like a simple answer, but uh, just start applying to places um, and go from there. The only thing that we really care about at DoorDash, I would say, as sort of the baseline is um, having a uh, eagerness to learn and a willingness to work hard. Um, and, you know, I, as far as the, the hiring profile goes and how, what, we're, what, we're, what our approach is for talent, we are really looking to cast a wide net. There is no, you know, cookie cutter profile that we're really looking for. We are really looking to find people from a wide variety of backgrounds because that's how we sort of improve uh, and bring in diverse perspectives. Great, Amani. Um, I would say, um, you know, I'm very tactical sometimes. I would say, you know, as you're reviewing job descriptions, actually evaluate the skills required and see how your background and skills um, align with it. And sometimes you have to take a couple of um, extra reviews to ensure that they're uh, the transferable skills, right? We've called out the fact that you can have a, um, a non-traditional background you know, quote unquote, but I think it's important to see what those transferable skills are uh, to this space, right? Um, I think to grow in this space, uh, continue to be curious, challenge yourself uh, to, to be 1% better every day. And I know it's a bit cliche because it's one of our values, but I think that's um, an incredible value for both for strategy and, you know, your own personal life. Uh, and just think about the business and you as a customer. I mean, obviously, you know, a data point or focus group of one is not statistically significant, but if you are the consumer, think about what you would want as the consumer. One thing I sometimes tell my team as we're working sometimes with merchants, most of, none of one on my team has a restaurant, but I give them the assignment, 
come up with a, a restaurant that is essentially yours, right? So mine, let's say, is a periodic table. So if I'm the owner of the periodic table, what matters to me, right? And that's what we do in our day to day. So I think as you are in this space, growing in this space, or trying to get into this space, think about what matters to the consumer. Think about what matters to the merchant. Think about what matters to the dasher. Love that, Toby. How about you? Yeah, um, we've heard a little bit from folks, but I would say stay curious and pursue excellence, not goals. Cody, take us home. I mean, I don't even know how to top that. That's just, that's, that's beautiful. Um, I will add a different flair. I think that the thing that the best people at DoorDash um, have is they're, they're humble. And so I would, I would encourage you to stay humble. Um, if you think you are the smartest person in the room, then you're likely missing a lot of opportunities to learn. Whereas if you come into every room asking, how can I learn from this engagement, this interaction, this conversation, then you will grow really, really, really fast. There are a lot of smart people here. And if you can pick up something from all of them, then you will grow really quickly. And everybody on this call and everybody that I think it's, I've seen be successful has that one attribute. Great. Thank you all. Uh, thanks to all the panelists for all of um, your answers here. We've got about 13 minutes left, so we're going to jump into some of the live Q&A that, that you've submitted as, as the audience. So, Toby, Rob, this uh, question for you. So, uh, someone wrote in to understand, how does DoorDash prioritize initiatives? And more broadly, how do you think about working with our product managers um, and cross-functional partners within a project? Uh, Rob, let's start with you, and then we'll go to Toby. Uh, yeah, the question around prioritization. Um, yeah, uh, the first step is really to align on, on a common currency for making trade-offs, right? So we have to get everybody in, to agree what is the North Star, what is the goal that we're all chasing, and then being able to ascribe, let's call it value, both tangible and strategic to the different initiatives. And then of course, you have to then stack rank against this framework that you've built. Um, I would say at DoorDash, we really, really, really try to take a and not either or an approach. But at the end of the day, right, there are things that we just simply would love to do, but cannot do immediately. Um, so we always try to get back to like first principles thinking, how do we um, how do we make these trade offs? Right. And against which principles are we are we trading off against? Um, and then from there, it is really just, you know, um, you have a project. Uh, what is the universe of different teams? Uh, inputs and uh, cross-functional partners that you might need to um, to contribute to or, you know, and to to make the make the project uh, successful. Would would you have any specific advice about working directly with our product managers? Is there anything di like a different approach that you would that you would tweak based on what you said? Um, well, as far as working with product managers, uh, it's really just taking empathy, right? There, from, from a project manager manager perspective, there's there's somebody like me pounding on their door every every other day about their projects. Um, so really understanding, you know, what is their roadmap? What is their perspective? What are their goals? What are their North Stars um, has, has been really, really helpful. Uh, and I think across the board, when it comes to working with all the teams, um, that, that approach has really made things much easier. Awesome. Toby, how would would that approach differ at all on your side? Yeah, no, I think, I think, um, I think again, we talked a lot about this, but uh, I think being customer obsessed is not just being customer obsessed externally. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about one of our like core customers too, where it's, is every single employee within our organization. And more importantly, like your cross-functional business partners also think of them as a customer. So what is, what is driving them in order to be successful, both in their career and their specialization, but also how do I bring them along in the, in kind of the North star that Rob is talking about the common currency that's trying to get all of us uh, to where we need to go. Um, it's not. It's, it's almost never, um, it's never a bat. People don't respond well to that. It's again, developing a common currency, a common goal of where you're going, and then making sure that when you're prioritizing, uh, you're all speaking the same language. Um, and I find if you're speaking the same language, uh, it's things are, the route is often easier uh, to get to than if you're not, so. Great. Uh, Cody, so this question specifically for you based on the, the gas rewards initiative that you walked us all through, how long did um, launching that solution take from problem identification through to launch? Oh man, this was a fun one. Um, I think it was two weeks um, total. I think 
that we we knew that something was going on. Like I think we all live in the world and we we see the gas prices and we, we knew something was happening. So it's not like we were just like not thinking about something. But I think from the moment that we said, oh, this is this is very real and we need to we need to get into action to the time that we launched something, got everything approved, got alignment internally. It was it was two weeks um, end to end. And I remember there was a lot of a lot of conversations with dashers on odd hours that we could get in and things like that. But it was it was a lot of fun. So two weeks. Wow. Um, that that's really no different, I think, than than a lot of the initiatives that, that we take on, especially topical ones, um, to give this group a, a sense of the pace at which DoorDash moves. Um, cool. So a question, a bunch of questions came in from from our military vets. So the question was, are we military friendly? And Yes, we are. Um, mentioned a few times, we spoke about our VP of Drive, Casey North. He's a vet. Um, and so if you want, we are happy to, to, to send the link to our vets, ERG, and leaders there. But we are very veteran friendly um, and look to encourage uh, our vet presence at DoorDash. Um, cool. OK, so let's let's move to, I want to hear from everyone on this. Uh, what advice would you give to an incoming SNO associate? How do they really hit the ground running in their first 90 days? Uh, Amani, let's start with you. I would say um, dig deep into our data and really understand our the metrics that we care about. Uh, and I think that, I think that's you know number one. I think every day we we look at the data, and I think that's probably the one thing you really need to get right. And then understand from your team's perspective uh, what uh, what are those data points that matter. Uh, and then I think the last piece would be. Uh, I think uh, kind of piggybacking off of what Toby said and understanding your cross-functional team's objectives is really learn those objectives because, you know, different SNO teams, SNO teams vary in size, but for a smaller team, sometimes when you have these, like my team, the Southeast team, or any of the regional teams, we work very cross-functionally. So you need to be able to influence. And I think one of the, the best ways to do that is understand what someone else's objective is and then kind of build your plan around that. So when I see partners from around the organization, my first question is, what is their objective? So if they are trying to drive uh, volume within one customer segment, then that's perfect for me because my overarching goal is uh, driving volume growth across all segments. So you know, for that conversation, I only care about that customer segment, obviously. And so I think when you're coming in as an associate, it's important to understand the data, understand what other people care about, and understand the data again. <laughs> Cody, what would be your take? Yeah, learn the business. It's really complex. Uh, you'll come, you'll join DoorDash and you'll say, I'm going to prove to everybody that I'm smart. And you're going to meet people and you're going to be like, oh man, all these people are smart. And then you're going to be like, now nah, I really got to prove that I'm smart. Um, and my advice to you is in your first 90 days, just learn the business. We were all there at one point. We all, you're at DoorDash because you want to be the best and you want to be great and you want to have impact. But spend the first 90 days learning the business. It will pay off 12 fold, 40 fold, 200 fold in the future because you'll be working on something and you'll be like, oh, yeah, I can't just do that because if I do this, then the merchant is going to experience this. And oh, I'm going to need to figure that out. Um, so you'll be a lot more successful if you just take the time to learn the business. Um, I tell everybody when they join, your first 90 days is for learning the business. Your next two, three, five, 10, 12, 15 years will be longing for your first 90 days where all you did was learn the business. Um, and it was a lot, it's a lot of fun. It's like the by far the most fun thing that, that we do and you just get to get in there and, and have impact. So that's my advice, learn the business. Toby, what would you add? Yeah, um, uh, I think I think you yeah, definitely, definitely learn the business. And then I would also say that every, one of us has a different flavor of a superpower. And I think our CEO, Tony, talks about this all the time, which is um, part of the brilliance of DoorDash, which is like a very uh, fast moving, high paced environment with a lot of, a lot of uh, I, you know, a lot of folks think about it, it's like drinking from a fire hose, is that when you drink from a fire hose, you'll lean on specific skill sets that are easier for you to process than others. And it's that lean, it's that like lean on the margin where, uh, you know, I personally will lean much more into uh, sales and being in front of customers than another peer. When you do that, 
you start to learn what that superpower is. And even though all of us are thought of as generalists, understanding where we spike or are a specialist in certain areas will also help you as you continue to grow in your career. Um, because it'll also help you figure out who you can kind of, who a complementary partner will be both cross-functionally and whether it's your boss or, or someone that reports into you. Um, and so I would just say, think about that framework uh, while you're learning onboarding the business as fast as possible, um, learning all the different data points within DoorDash. Um, I would also say, uh, learn a little bit about yourself too. Rob, what do you think? Yeah, I would, uh, I would echo all of the, the responses so far, right? So understand our data, learn the business. I would add, you know, learn the organizations, right? So understanding who does what uh, specifically um, will be really, really helpful uh, from the three-sided marketplace perspective as you're thinking about um, your particular area of business. Um, and then also I would say just generally, um, and this I think is becoming more and more relevant as DoorDash has gotten bigger, but uh, don't be afraid to ask questions and challenge the status quo. Um, you know, you're here for a reason um, and your perspective is super valuable. And if you see something that may or may not make sense, um, you should be, I mean, welcomed uh, to, to ask questions and, and challenge uh, the way things are done. Great. We've got time for one more question. So I, uh, I want to understand what future career pathways do you think um, having a role in SNO can open up for you? Uh, Cody, let's start with you. Oh man, you can do anything you want. Uh, I think that sounds like really generic and cheesy, but you really can. Uh, I think all of us joined in very different ways, in very different um, places in our lives and different thoughts and things that we did. And look at us now, like we're all doing something very different, right? So I was the AGM in Fort Worth. I sold restaurants every day and onboarded drivers during the off hours. And like, that was what I did. And now I do this and like, this is, it's, it's surreal. I think Toby was like a launcher, probably sleeping in, in every office we had, right? So that you can come in and you can really make your career whatever you wanna make it. Um, so I think that the, the career path is, what I tell people is how, how you advance your career within DoorDash, something's gonna come up. Within the next seven days, I can guarantee you, something new is gonna come up that we're gonna wanna go do. And your leader and other leaders are going to come together and we're going to say, what's the list? Who could do this? Right. And there's two questions. Who can move on from their current thing? Meaning you've built a good enough team behind you. And who do we trust to solve a problem? Which is, have you solved the problems that you're supposed to solve today? And if you can do both of those things, then the sky is the limit because you will, you will constantly get tapped for new things, even if you know nothing about them. So that is, I, I say that the sky's the limit, you can do anything you want, but I, I genuinely mean it. And that's a little bit about how I think it comes to life. How about you, Toby? Yeah, I'm, I'm a perfect manifestation of that. So uh, I, I, uh, uh, I have, I joined as a launcher, as Cody said, when we had 70 folks sleeping on air mattresses, I built out a large partnerships organization selling to large restaurant groups, CPGs, retailers, big tech companies doing, doing deals, leading a team of a hundred plus folks. And that, and then I, you know, gave it all away with a small group of folks founded and built our ads business. Um, and so I think the the short answer is you can do anything. I think the, again, the core skill is if I think SNO is very, very important, or is a great place to, to build your career because it helps you find your superpower fast, rapid iteration learning, it humbles you. And then on top of it, it humbles you in a way where you also build confidence. Um, because I think some of the best leaders in the world are also some of the quietest and most solemn because they know uh, that uh, and most humble because they know that uh, leading is difficult. You can learn all those things really quickly. And with that sort of playbook, that sort of foundation, you can really do, as Cody said, anything. Love that. Um, I think a perfect ending. Uh, so in closing, would love to thank the panelists. Thank you for sharing your experience uh, working in SNO at DoorDash. Thank you everyone for attending the event um, and we're hiring. You saw a bunch of the messages come through. All of us have, have open roles on our team. Please check out careers.doordash.com. Um, and yeah, thank you for coming and we look forward to seeing you next time.